Hey, Daniel Snyder here. Joining me today is Mary Childs, co-host of NPR's Planet Money podcast and author of the book, The Bond King, the true story of legendary Bill Gross, the man who invented bond trading, built an empire within PIMCO on the West Coast, made billions, and then as the cover states right here, lost it all. Mary, thanks for joining me today. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. So, I mean, you've been in this industry for a long time. You've been tracking and writing about the bond market for quite, you know, you, you've been at Barron's, you've been at Financial mm -hmm. Times, you've been at Bloomberg. Yeah. But I got to ask you, how did the idea for this book about Bill Gross come about for you? So I was covering corporate credit markets at Bloomberg in, oh gosh, from like 10 to 14. And I got like a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, which I now realize is kind of inherited just from like the arrogance of bond people. But I was like, people don't understand the bond market and they need to, like everyone pays attention to the stock market. And that's like so dumb. And, you know, that like kind of nested in my heart in some way. And I just felt like there was indeed this like wildly influential market that people didn't understand and talk about in the same way. And central to that market is of course, PIMCO. And I ran into them a lot in my corporate coverage days, but then I started covering them full time in April 2014, at which time they were in the midst of this like enormous management change and um, about to low key implode the details of which you can read in the book. Um, but it seemed to me like, you know, when you start a new beat, or at least when I started a new beat, I'm like, okay, I want to read everything that's out there. And I was looking around for like, you know, I was also covering BlackRock and Janice and Double Line and Guggenheim. And I was just like, what, you know, you can read Michael Lewis's book about the origins of like the mortgage-backed securities market. But to a large extent, I felt like there was a hole in in the world of like literature and, and books to, to talk about the bond market and its import in a sort of accessible non-textbook way. And so I decided to do it. I don't know. Which is phenomenal, right? I think the timing right now is really peculiar as well, because yeah. I think a lot of investors are talking nowadays about how the bond market and the stock market and where there used to be correlation and flight to safety in the bond market, there's not because of inflation. There's so many right. factors, right? So the bond market right. is in such big conversation right now. Totally. Um, but to go back to the book, because you break it down so extremely well within that and, and the start of PIMCO and how it got started and how it was a risky chance. I mean, you must have done tons of resource, research. And, and you had tons of interviews and, and went through tons of sources and videos and everything else throughout yeah. the writing of this book. So I, I want to ask you, what was the most shocking or surprising thing for you that you learned while you were writing this book? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I wish I had like a pat answer for you because um, I <laughs> There are a number of ways I can go with this. One of the things that surprised me the most was like, I could not for the life of me, like you know, it was, I was doing a lot of the research in 2017 while all of these marches and protests were happening, you know, women, me too, all this stuff. And I was like, there are like no women in this book. They're functionally there too. And, you know, in the kind of like drama and the narrative of PIMCO's rise and uh, the 2014 events. And I was kind of frustrated by that at the time. And the, the thing I like tried to like wedge it in sort of like ham fistedly like I was like okay and then by the way women and like it didn't make any sense and so it, it was it was I learned a lot about like the settlements and the the various like allegations over the decades um and then I published almost none of it just because it made no sense in the narrative because these you know these stories end up so far from the center of power by design um you know and end up being kind of just like fringe and unimportant in that way in like the corporate story and as a person who cares about that stuff it was really painful, um, but to, to not be able to incorporate that. But because this is such a bummer of an answer, I'm going to give you a little anecdote. <laughs> so this is not like scandalous by any stretch, but it made me laugh. Um, one of the the people in the book, she um, she was telling me this story about how when she used to do interviews back in the very early days at PIMCO, um, she had a bit of a like litmus test where she had a cuckoo clock in her office. And if she was doing an interview for a potential PIMCO employee and the cuckoo clock went off and the little bird jumps out and says, cuckoo, if the interviewee jumped, she would be like, you know what? It's not going to work out. This isn't a fit. Mm. I'm sorry. Cause their temperament was clearly so ill-suited for the work environment at PIMCO. So that was one of my favorite little, and that somehow didn't make it into the book. Um, I, I think I just forgot to find it at home, but <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you just brought up the workplace, right? You do dive into the work culture of PIMCO and, um, you know, I remember reading about how you were talking about their silence on the floor while you're yeah. there and like the, the trying to build a community, but also, I mean, you're talking about a man, Bill Gross, who 
was just so unique and was so often right. right and was so almost controlling to a large degree. And it's like, yeah, how do you balance the narrative within this book of being like, we should talk about PIMCO versus this is why PIMCO is who PIMCO is because of Bill. So I was just kind of curious in, in workplace manner of what you're talking about. Yeah. You, you talk about, there's a lot of people that read the book and were like, wow, you captured this workplace environment very well. Um, was that something that was a, an initial strive for you to be like, I really want to communicate this? Or was that something that just kind of added on over time? It was definitely part of what I wanted. There were a couple of things that I was like, I need to communicate like the intensity of the firm for sure. Like that's so definitional and foundational to what PIMCO is and how they think of themselves and how everyone else thinks of them. That if I got that wrong, I think the whole book would have collapsed. Like I think the, no one would have been able to read it and take it seriously. So that was very important to me to get right. Obviously the bond market stuff was very important to get right. You know, um, I was so elated. Like I worked so hard to get it right. But even so, you know, there's going to be some word that's like wrong on page 97, just because like you know, this thing has gone through a thousand different edits, but to, to get like a wall street journal review that says that I like am fluent in bonds from Jim Grant, I was like, okay. Like I didn't, I didn't that have that word wrong on page 97. Um, that's a random page. Don't go looking. I have no idea what's on page 97, <laughs> but it, it is. Um, so th those were kind of really important, but I think the most, most important thing to get right for me was Bill Gross. Like, this is not a biography. And I didn't ever want it to be like, he grew up in the beautiful babbling creek, of, but I wanted to communicate clearly and in a, as fulsome a manner as I could, who Bill is and what makes him tick. And like, there's this weird, like misunderstanding of him or, or kind of a dissonance between what he thinks he puts forward and what he actually is. And I think he still struggles with that. I think everyone who worked around him struggles with that. So capturing that's almost impossible because it's truly the parable of the blind men and the elephant, you know, they're all feeling a different part and describing what they're feeling. And it's like not adding up to what an elephant looks like. So I had to interview so many people just to get kind of this, this sketch of Bill. And of course, Bill was like, you know, the most important person to talk to in that. Um, and he was very generous with his time and, and his thoughts, but it was, it was a, there are so many contradictory things about him. And, you know, he changed over the decades. And so I had to kind of wrap, uh, wrangle all of those disparate views and portraits to, to kind of build this picture. And I think I did it. I think I threaded the needle where I think it, it did come out like, he's a person, he's not a, a god, he's not a, you know, a caricature, he's a real person. And I think you do come away at the end of the book feeling like you sort of get him. Yeah, I mean, what you just kind of talked about, I mean, I think you did an excellent job, first off, is like, you really did tell the compelling story of him as an individual within these scenarios and, you know, how he started by, you know, going to the casino in Las Vegas versus yeah. then going into the bond market and having the worldwide casino, but also yeah. the fact that people change over time. Right. And, and how do you balance this guy that was just so right all the time? Um, but yeah. also smart enough because I, I was pulling this quote out of your book when he was talking about the disease of size and success. Right. And Patient, he recognized right? that himself, that he was just yeah. like, we are growing so big. This could be the downfall of us. And then mm -hmm. obviously we have what happened in his life. And I mean, you still have a lot of power players in this book that are still relevant in today's market. Is that still surprising to you? It's awkward is what it is. Like, I think, you know, I think one of the things that that makes this book kind of electric is that everyone is still alive and and you know still playing in their markets and very big and 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 to be fair like I always aim to make sure that the whatever I whatever you know journalistic endeavor I do that the people involved like don't feel wronged but it's almost never the case that they're like yeah you did a great job because I don't do PR so that balance and I, you know that this is familiar to you um that balance is always kind of a delicate emotional one but um but I do think like the that's why it, another reason why it's so important is that this is a living market this is you know the people who created this market are with us the people who run this market are running it like we haven't changed substantially the structure of this market in ages and i think it's worth examining and i think it's worth at least understanding you know we can't make better choices if we don't understand it yeah i also just love i mean you did an entire chapter on the great financial crisis yeah. Right. And the influence that PIMCO had during that time. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, was that surprising for you? Because it was kind of surprising for me being somebody that, you know, we still look back on the, the great financial crisis and we're referencing it a lot right now with recession right. fears and everything yeah. else. It's kind of like, 
is PIMCO in the background again right now? Is I think a question that pops in my head. I think, I mean, yes, this is again, a, a you know, a fundamentally like bond market, like it's not necessarily driven by the market that they sit in quite as much as it was last time, but you know, like, like they aren't such a large player in like driving inflation, arguably, you know? So I think that the positioning is certainly different this time. Um, but they are the experts, you know, and they are very central and foundational still to the bond market and its workings. And, you know, every decision that about like bond market structure or a derivative structure, like there are committees and and PIMCO sits on these committees. So I do think that it is still absolutely the power player that it was in 2008, 2009. I think the, you know, that really established their reputation that the financial crisis really was a, a way for them to make a lot of money for clients, but also to kind of, to me that that was more or less their most influential, most public publicly influential moment. And I think that, you know, they're still out there doing like thought leadership about, you know, the transition to a higher interest rate paradigm and all this stuff that that's very useful. Um, I'm curious how their power manifests in this one, because it isn't quite as, you know, the trade in 2009 was to do what the government's about to do, but do it first to buy what the government's about to buy and then sell it to them. And it's less clear here. It's a lot less clear here how to maybe pull that one off. So yes, but it's a, you know, I, I, I'm i trying to avoid saying this time it's different, but. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, but to, so to wrap this up a little bit, I've got one more loaded question for you, if that's all Ooh, right. Okay. Uh, what book is coming next? <laughs> You know, a lot of people have been asking, um, and I'm flattered. I'm honored by the question. I will say this one really took it out of me. So I'm not going to be doing a Ken Griffin book anytime soon. Um, that's been the number one suggestion. I'm like, I'm not walking into that trap. Um, I don't know. Good suggestions are welcome. Yeah, I know there's some people out there. I mean, it's not exactly bomb, but Powell. Powell's I mean, in conversation. A so lot true. of complicated, but anyways. Um, so before we wrap up, where can people follow you if they want to interact with you more? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at, at MDC. I'm on it far too much, so you can definitely find me there. Um, I am I have a Substack that I update annually at offtherun.substack.com, and I'm on NPR's Planet Money on average yeah. like once or twice a month. So Amazing. Thank you so much, Mary. Thanks for spending Thank time with me today. Guys, Thank I can't recommend this book enough. Ben, I literally binge read it. Like You get into this the way that Mary wrote this and, and really broke down Bill Gross as a man um and and the guy that revolutionized capital markets for the better in all honesty Absolutely. um go check it out give it a read interact with mary mary i wish you all the success from this you deserve it thank you so much i really appreciate that